Everyone knows about Alexander the Great and his epic conquest of most of the known world from the perspective of the Greeks 2300 years ago. But few today know about his father, Philip II of Macedonia, the guy who transformed Macedonia from a backwater kingdom to a major world power and who built and trained the army that Alexander then inherited and used to conquer the Persian Empire. So was Alexander really that great on his own or did he owe much of his success to the work of his father, Philip? That's what we're going to find out today. Hi, thanks for tuning in to Ancient Greece Declassified. I'm Lantern Jack, and my guest today is Adrian Goldsworthy, author of the new book, Philip and Alexander, Kings and Conquerors. Now, what sets this book apart from the many other books you can find on Alexander the Great is that it gives Philip, his father, a central role in the story. The first half of this hefty tome recounts the adventures and accomplishments of Philip, and the second half presents the more familiar story of Alexander's conquests as a sequel to the campaigns of Philip. Adrian Goldsworthy, welcome to Ancient Greece Declassified. Thank you for inviting me. Now, besides being an ancient historian with many history books that you've written, you are also a novelist. You've written um, historical fiction novels set in some in Roman Britain, some in the Napoleonic era. So I'm just curious, how do you manage to be so productive? What is your secret? Well, uh, one thing that you've noticed in, in um, Britain at the moment, we're still in lockdown, nearly everything's closed, you can't go anywhere. That's pretty much the normal life for an author. If you write full time, you're spending an awful lot of time on your own anyway. But I love writing. It, it's, it's very addictive. And I, in the end, I write the sort of books that I would like to read, but that aren't there. So there's a they're hard work, particularly a big project like Philip and Alexander, where you're working on it for several years. And, you know, by the end, you really want to get this over with and get it finished. But there's still a sheer joy. I hope in my books, I convey some of the, the thrill and excitement I've always found in history. You know, these stories and these people are spectacular. They're exciting, especially to view from a distance, because some of them probably weren't too pleasant to live through. But uh, it's fun. It's fun. Great. Well, you're lucky to have a job that uh, you consider a lot of fun. <laughs> I keep thinking someone will find out about it and tell me to stop because it doesn't sound fair, but uh, I've been very lucky. Right. So let's jump in to the topic of today, which is your book, Philip and Alexander. And I guess the first most obvious question is, why are people even still interested in Alexander primarily 2,300 years later? It is staggering. I mean, he is still a household name. People have heard of Alexander the Great, even if they don't know too much about him. You know, there have been a couple of movies. Um, he's it, It's a name in part because we're still calling children Alexander. You know, I've got two godsons. They're both called Alec or Alexander. So it's it's a common name. It's He's survived. And... There's a lot about him that's a sort of quintessential Western hero in that he doesn't live that long. You know, he has this spectacular success in a very short time. He's short, he's unconventional, he's, you know, a bit scruffy, he's shaggy haired, he stands out, he doesn't follow the rules of, you know, he shaves his, his chin so he doesn't have a beard like everyone should, he doesn't dress like everyone should, he doesn't act like everyone should. He's the cool kid who can reject the advice of his elders and betters and win. But he also dies before he gets old. You know, he remains forever the youthful, dashing hero. He doesn't become the old man struggling to cope. He doesn't ever stop looking good. So there's a lot about him. There's a lot in the story. And it is staggering when you think about it. Macedonia was a, a nowhere place before Philip came on the scene and built up the kingdom. But even when Alexander succeeded, it's still a minor kingdom to the north of Greece. And they set out and they marched thousands and thousands of miles, conquering everything in their path. You know, they start in northern Greece and they get as far as Pakistan, as it is today. And they do all that on foot or riding a horse. And that's staggering. You know, people haven't done this. Armies don't tend to advance as fast as that, even in the modern world. So there is something truly spectacular about it. And because he didn't have to live with the consequences, he conquers this empire, but he doesn't have to make it work. You know, he dies before the problems really start. So you end up with someone who is fascinating, exciting. He does all the dramatic stuff. He never has to dull the, do the dull things. And he's also a man so full of, of contradictions. He can be this inspiring leader, and yet he can treat his men like dirt. He can be very generous, and he can murder one of his best friends, you know, in a drunken rage. So this is a very strange man. 
So everything about Alexander is fascinating. And I think it's that's partly why this, this story has just lasted. But it's also because people in the ancient world, from Alexander himself telling everyone, I am incredible and I'm maybe a god and I'm doing all these things and I'm better than everyone else. But those that came afterwards realized there was something odd and strange about this story. And Roman emperors would measure themselves to Alexander as he remains the greatest conqueror. You know, can you you match him? You certainly can't outdo him. So the fascination begins early and it's just stayed there. It's, it's persisted in our culture. Right. Well, besides Alexander, who has um, captivated people's imaginations for millennia, uh, in writing this book, you seem to have gotten equally interested, if not perhaps even more interested, in his father, Philip II of Macedonia. So what is it about... Philip that drew you into this project? I wouldn't have written a book just on Alexander the Great because there's there's at least one new one every year and lots of old ones being reprinted. And that's fine, but it is only part of the story. You know, Alexander springs up, he's within two years of becoming king, he's invaded Persia, he never returns to Macedonia. You know, it's all about conquest, it's all about success. Actually, it was my publishers who came and asked me, would you do a, a book on Philip and Alexander? And the more I thought about it, the more I felt, well, this really needs to be done because people know about Alexander, particularly the enthusiasts. And there are lots of people who are almost obsessed with the man, but they tend to ignore Philip. And Philip is simply the old man who's waiting to die, waiting to get killed so that Alexander can take over as the young dashing hero. But they forget that when Philip became king just over 20 years before he was the young dashing hero. He was the unproven warrior. And Macedonia was on the brink of being ripped apart by its much stronger neighbours from southern Greece, from the tribes of Illyria and Thrace. It was weak. Macedonia really did not matter. When Philip was born, even when Alexander was born, people probably didn't care that much in the wider world. They didn't think these people would be important. You know, it is a little bit as if Belgium would suddenly conquer the world. You know, these are very small, unimportant places and yet they come to dominate, under Philip's life, southern Greece, and then the rest of the world. So, so much of the story is about Philip. His achievement is quite staggering, that, that somebody could do this, could turn this around in such a short time. And then not only do that, but pass the power on to his son when Philip is murdered. That's the thing that needs to be explained, because without that, none of what follows makes any sense at all. Right. Now, for those of us who don't know all the details of Philip's life and accomplishments, uh, it might be helpful for us to visualize him if you could draw a modern parallel. Is there any statesman or general from more recent history who Philip reminds you of? I think perhaps the closest is one who's perhaps not as well known as they might be, be Bishaka, king of the Zulus in the early 19th century, who, again, is not expected. He's son of the king, but not expected to succeed and fights his way to power in the middle of Kess and turns an obscure people, one tribe within lots of groups of other tribes, into a united kingdom and then expands and expands and does it all really rapidly and does that through a military revolution, but also through sheer personality and is very active, very ruthless. So there have been a few, but it's quite hard. There, there have been very few revolutionary changes where a country has gone from being so weak to so strong in such a short time that um, there aren't many others that I think could really are the Phillips of this world. Well, if I may offer my own take on this, the one um, historical figure that kept coming to my mind as I was reading your book was Peter the Great of Russia. And there are a lot of parallels, but, uh, you know, just to name a few, um, like Philip, Peter was born into a country that was considered on the fringes of the civilized world. It was kind of a backwater. Like Philip, uh, Peter spent his youth in exile in arguably the most advanced state of the time. So Philip spent his youth in Thebes, which was a, the great power in Greece at the time. Peter spent his youth in the Netherlands. And both of them learned how modern states operate. And they brought back that knowledge to their own kingdom and then used and then built new cities, reformed the military and and turned around their, you know, marginal kingdoms into major powers. So I don't know. Does that strike you as a, as a fair uh, parallel? That works. I mean, I would guess his Russia's bigger um, and potentially has more. But then Macedonia has a lot of potential. And I suppose the big difference is he doesn't have an Alexander to follow him. So there's a more steady growth and then fluctuations with various um 
rulers of Russia, depending on their ability and the pressure from outside. So yeah, but that's, I'd, I'd not thought of that, but that's actually a good one. Yes, Peter does not have an Alexander to follow him. And actually, I think it's really difficult to find a modern parallel for Alexander, more difficult than for Philip. Uh, do you have any kind of modern uh, parallel for Alexander? I mean, in a sense, people like Napoleon, obviously, particularly when he's going off on his Egyptian expedition, is thinking very much in terms of Alexander and getting to India. And even, you know, there's some of his writings that he's talking about making him, you know, his own religion where he'll be the head of it. Um, so there's that dream. And in part, that's that classical education. Of course, he's not following a king as such, but through revolutionary France and the, the consulate he'll rise. So there's, there's something where you get, but Napoleon also will eventually march to really big defeats in quite a short time. So for all the spectacle, Alexander doesn't do that. Beyond that, I don't think there's the scope. I mean, even for the Romans, you know, Julius Caesar is supposed to have wept reading about Alexander or seeing a bust of Alexander because he was so old before he could do anything like that. There aren't many situations in recent history where a king gets given command of a kingdom at such a time when the rest of the world is so vulnerable and freedom to do pretty much what he likes. Um, so, no, I, don't, I mean, there isn't really an Alexander. There's lots of people who thought they were and liked to try, but no one's had quite that success. But also, as I say, there is a, a sense of fortune for his legacy and memory that Alexander dies when he does because he doesn't get the chance to fail. Controlling that kingdom, facing rebellions, may have been a lot harder than just moving on to the next conquest and the next conquest. I guess Napoleon was like Alexander without the good luck, which is ironic because Napoleon said that famously that uh, luck is part of his strategy. Mm. And, it, and was, um, yeah, and again with Napoleon, many of his military reforms are based around, around things that have been happening partly under the, the Bourbon monarchs, but also in that revolutionary period. A lot of the theories he puts into into practice, people had already been talking about within the French military. And then Napoleon brings it all together into this system that works and dazzles the world for a few years. So there are, there are, you know, there are aspects where he does, um, but then most successful military leaders have usually built around things that have been done by others who never got to fight, never got to try it in quite the same way. So there, there's always that element. There, there, there is almost no story in history where you can say it just starts with this one person or this one kingdom something's always come before and they've always taken things from others and learned from that and built on that. Yeah, exactly. Now, when, um, when Alexander sets off on his expedition to conquer uh, what the Greeks thought of as Asia, he was doing what Philip had been preparing to do for years. Uh, but, you know, Philip was cut off by his assassination. So there's this hypothetical question that some historians like to think about, which is that, you know, would Philip have been able to accomplish what Alexander later did. And to kind of even the playing field for this question, let's just imagine that Philip was rejuvenated before setting out. It was made younger again. His one eye that was lost was restored. So he was full of the youthful energy that Alexander had. Would he, given his own you know, particular skill set and experience, would he have been able to do what Alexander did? Most of what Alexander does is right out of Philip's playbook. You know, the way the army operates, the way he fights campaigns, the way he tries to win some of the local leaders over diplomatically, it's all what Philip's been doing. And the army Alexander commands is almost entirely Philip's army. Nearly all its senior and junior officers and many of its soldiers are men who fought under Philip. So this is the team Philip's created. And you can't help thinking that Philip would also have been highly successful with exactly the same team of people and would have done much the same thing. The difference is perhaps Philip, partly because of force of circumstances, and in his early years when he's campaigning, he's having to fight fires at different ends of his kingdom. As his kingdom expands, you know, he's dealing with the Greeks in the south, but he's also dealing with the Illyrians, with the Thracians, with different leaders amongst them. You look at Philip and you think this is a man who might have consolidated more, who might not simply have just kept on going and going. You sometimes feel with Alexander that he doesn't want to stop because he doesn't know what he's going to do when he stops. Whereas Philip does know what he wants to do. It's a man who's supposed to be prouder of his diplomatic successes than his military successes. And, you know, so maybe you would have ended up with smaller conquests, but they might have endured more. And you might have had a kingdom of, you know, Asia Minor, parts of Syria and Egypt, say, but that actually survived for centuries as a whole. Um 
On the other hand, if you don't destroy the Persian Empire in the end, it's always going to be there, as Alexander's supposed to have said, and they're going to come back and attack you because they've got no reason to like you when you've invaded them. Um, so it's hard to say. I mean, the what-ifs of history are great for conversation, but you can't prove anything either way. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and You mentioned that Philip might have been better at consolidating his, his uh, conquests, and Alexander might have not wanted to stop. And that's an interesting... Um, thing to think about because there is a big difference between good conquerors and good statesmen as aristotle says a lot of a lot of you know countries and r rulers they know how to conquer but they don't know how to make use of their conquests and famously he says that the spartans were great at winning wars but in winning wars in in defeating the athenian empire they ruined themselves politically because they didn't know how to then rule Alexander died too young for us to really know how he would have been as a statesman. Um, but given his short career, do you think he had that talent that Philip had for diplomacy, for consolidation, you know, for making use of his territories? It's hard to say. I mean, I don't think he had the interest that Philip had. And maybe Philip's had to develop that because in the early years, you know, things really are desperate and he has to keep compromising with neighbors, making peace with one so he can go and defeat another because he can't fight them all at the same time. And that maybe gets him used to the idea that talking is very effective. Alexander doesn't have to talk very often. You know, he's given this great army, he's given this very simple task of a war and, you know, he clearly doesn't want to stop. He doesn't want to stop in India and the, the various theories that have claimed, you know, it's all stage managed at the, the high, um, high and he's, he wants his men to refuse to go. So it gives a good excuse. It's clearly nonsense. He could have just stopped if he wanted to and ordered them back. And the fact that everybody, all the sources are talking about his great plans for the future when he dies and he's about to embark on this big expedition down to the Arabian Gulf. He's got plans to go westwards. So, you feel this is someone who, he likes fighting, he's very good at it. And one thing that's always bothered me with many of the biographies and studies of Alexander is all the talk of what was he planning? You know, what was he going to do in the long run? What was his vision of empire? How did he view the relationship between the Greeks and the Asians? All this sort of thing. But when you look at how he spent his life, nearly all his time is devoted to traveling, to fighting, to preparing for the next fight and moving on. He doesn't actually have much time sitting down and thinking and talking and doing the day-to-day -day work of being a king. And that's in great contrast. I mean, you, it, it's a similar, to, in a sense, to Julius Caesar, where people talk about his plans as dictator. But he actually only had about six months in Rome before he was murdered, after the, the civil war in Spain. He's barely there at all. To compare him to, say, Augustus, who has decades, to develop very gradually a plan of how do we make a regime that works... Caesar and Alexander even more so, they don't really have the time. And in Alexander's case, you feel it's a temperamental thing. He likes this. You know, military activity is simple in the end. There's an enemy, there's a problem that faces you, you work out a way around it, you work out a way to beat them, and then you move on to the next one. And clearly he gets a buzz from all of this. Um, and he's very good at it. And the army's very good at it, but they get tired before he gets tired. He, it's It's... Again, it's, it's the paradox of this man who can inspire these men to do incredible things, but then doesn't understand when they're fed up. You know, there's that sort of lack of this, the man who can sh pour out the last drop of water given to him and wait, dusty, covered in, in muck, you know, as everybody staggers in from the desert after a long march to make sure they're all safe, and yet then doesn't know, look, we're fed up, we want a break, we just want to go home, or we want to stop for a bit. Doesn't mean we want to stop forever, but we want to stop for a bit. So I think there are there is a profound difference between Philip and Alexander. It might be life experience. Alexander's never had to struggle. He's never been a hostage in Thebes or anywhere else, or any prospect that he could be. And he's never had to lose, which Philip has a couple of times early on. You know, Alexander always wins. So that's that becomes... Um, you know, something you just expect, you think of as natural. Yeah, that all makes sense. I think the one thing that um, speaks to Alexander's potential talent in statecraft is his founding of cities. Like he, when he founded so many cities and they are strategically located in such a way that you think maybe he had a, a kind of long-term plan as well. I think he clearly has, but I don't think he spends as much time on it 
as we tend to think or we because we find that interesting because that's clearly the most important thing and in the end you know if as I, i've tried in the the book as i have in biographies of other people like caesar or mark antony to devote as much space as we can equally to what they're actually doing so what you get with alexander is a very repetitive story where he does the same thing he finds a tribe they oppose him he finds a way to defeat them and massacres lots of them subdue them and moves on and the next one and the next one so he is doing these sensible things, and I think he was a talented individual, but he doesn't actually have much time to devote to this. And there's little sign that in the months before his death that he was thinking that, yes, I want to do this. I want to sit down and consolidate. Now, to some extent, these are driving forces. You know, this is Philip has built his kingdom around constant success, constant military victory. So the army needs war. And they need glory and they need rewards and they need to be able to promote people and they need the spectacle. So they are trapped a little bit in this cycle. But there's also an element of you have to wonder, you know, there are times when he could have stopped. The, the, the moving to India doesn't really seem necessary. Just I can do this if I want to. Um, and Arabia. It's not essential by any means. The Parthians never really control the Arabian Gulf, and they have an empire in that region for 400 years. Um, you know, under the Achaemenid Persians, it's loose links. But so there, are these areas that other empires in the region don't feel the need to conquer, but he wants to have a go. Yeah, I mean, and the fact that he died in his early 30s. I mean, there seems to be this weird age uh, of around 32, 33, where a lot of famous people die at that age. <laughs> like Mozart, Jesus, Jimi Hendrix, Alexander. I mean, these are all totally unrelated characters, but do you think that there maybe is a certain kind of personality type that is just so unstoppable that they just inevitably burn out in one way or another by the time they reach the early 30s? I think, I mean, you do feel with Alexander, this is someone so restless that they just could not sit still. You know, they have to go on doing these things. And... Um, the great danger is, you know, you can't, you're, you're writing a biography, but it really turns into a history of what Philip and particularly Alexander did. You can't say much about them as people. You'd like to know more about the, the driving forces behind this. Um, but also, if you take lots of risks, and if you, you know, Alexander is physically fit in the sense that he's very good at fighting, he's very good at writing and traveling, but he's also, you know, he drinks extremely heavily. He takes risks in battle. Um, and it is striking looking back at this. I hadn't realized the extent to which the number of wounded in these battles is always far, far higher than the number of fatalities in a way that's not reported in other ancient battles. So clearly, you know, you're, you're protected enough. You feel like a medieval knight in plate armor. You're probably going to survive. So it's not that much of a gamble, but it's still a bit of a gamble each time. And you tend to get lots of injuries and you spend a lot of your time recovering from these things. So, um, I think there probably is, there's this burnout element where um that might be that clearly wasn't there with philip um you know you don't feel that philip is struggling with coping with with middle age when he's in his 40s because the striking thing is that royal family of macedonia if they don't die violently they tend to live to a very old age you know you get lots of people in their 70s and another thing that surprised me in the book is the number of elderly war leaders, whether you've got Bardalus of the Illyrians in his 80s, Aegis of Sparta in his 80s, they're still leading armies. These, these, you know, and you think of life expectancy in the ancient world as so low, but these people have beaten all the odds and they're still going in the same way some of Philip and Alexander's veterans will be into their 70s fighting in the wars of the successors and still scaring the living daylights out of all their opponents. You know, it, it's, um, it's very hard to imagine, but there clearly are some really tough old guys around at this time. But Alexander just isn't like that, you know, so, um, and it's hard to imagine, but whether that's simply because we know that's when he dies, that it makes the story all the more dramatic, all the more poignant as with some of these other figures, you know, if if Mozart had lived twice as long, composed twice as much, um, how would you, you deal with that? Because he did so much in that time anyway. Um, so it's, again, we're coming back to what ifs, but there, there does seem, we feel that Alexander's story is almost natural, but that's because we know the end before we start it. And that's, that's the big danger with all the hindsight is a problem always for a historian, but with someone like Alexander, and Philip, it makes us forget how shocking all of this was, how you know incredible it was. 
There were plenty of people who were alive when Alexander died who could remember a time before Philip and must have been looking around and thinking, wow, you know, how did that happen? You know, Macedonia, how have they conquered the world? This, this doesn't make sense. This isn't the world I understand. Yeah, that is amazing. Um, and here we are getting sucked into the Alexander half of the story again, but let's bring it back to Philip. Uh, what do you think was Philip's uh, biggest talent or superpower, if he had one? <laughs> it's, or what was his main accomplishment? I think the main accomplishment almost is surviving those early years, but then keeping on winning. He's, again, we forget, you know, he's only in his early 20s when he becomes king. He's the third brother to become king. Both the others have died violently, one murdered, one in battle. When he was born, no one would have expected him to become king at all. He's been a hostage in Thebes for a few years, and suddenly he's in charge of this kingdom. There's rivals from other branches of the family. You're being invaded on all sides. To take the Macedonians when everyone thinks they've just lost the best of their soldiers, their kings just died in battle against the Illyrians, to turn them round over the course of a winter, beat the Illyrians, beat off the pretenders, start beating everybody else, and then as soon as you've done that, you don't stop and think, phew, let's try and recover for a bit. It's, okay, I need more territory. I need more resources. Right, I'm heading into the Greek Chersonese. I'm going to start conquering there. He's, again, like Alexander, has this restlessness. You know, he clearly has immense amounts of energy. And it's interesting you get the story. I mean, there's the one that Philip is supposed to have liked telling himself. He had charm in a way that Alexander possibly didn't. Alexander was more a force of nature. Philip was someone where he could persuade people. He could make a joke to lighten the mood. And there's a story where his men are on the verge of mutiny because he hasn't paid them properly. And they come to complain whilst Philip is wrestling with a, by the by his name, a Greek wrestler. Philip finishes the wrestling bout, walks past all the mutinous soldiers, dives into a swimming pool, and then starts swimming lengths up and down. So having said to them, look, I'll deal with your problem later on, and waits for them all to get bored and go away. And he's got that sort of charm that he can get away with it. And he's supposed to have told this story repeatedly. And then afterwards, he sorts it out. There isn't another mutiny. So that I think Philip is more of someone who could work people and their emotions in different... In the same way you get the impression from the Greek embassies, the Athenian embassies, like Aeschines and Demosthenes, where they're talking about dealing with Philip. And however they're trying to present him, there's still this sense that this man's a real politician. This is the sort of man you can walk into the room convinced you're going to oppose him in every way, and yet somehow you walk out and you've done a deal with him. I'm also curious about the, the bigger macro picture. And if we zoom out a bit and consider the Hellenistic world of the ancient Mediterranean, it, it seems to be an age of conquerors in a way that the earlier classical period or archaic period were not, in the sense that you have these figures like Alexander, Hannibal, Pyrrhus of Epirus, Scipio, uh, Julius Caesar, who command these armies over hundreds of miles, uh, conquering swaths of territory, including millions of people. And again, you don't find such figures really in the Mediterranean earlier. So what do you think changed in the um, you know 4th and 3rd centuries BC that turned the Mediterranean into this uh, playground of conquerors? It's a lot of factors. I think some of it is the rise and development of states and kingdoms beyond a certain size. Probably these people had been there, but their accomplishments were on a smaller scale and they're not recorded in the same way. You know, it's easy to forget. We take for granted the fact that there are all these Greek cities and colonies scattered all around the Mediterranean into the Black Sea, you know, in Asia Minor, all this sort of thing. These Greeks got around from what's a small, you know, not particularly fertile part of the world. There were Greeks everywhere, just as there were Phoenicians everywhere and Carthaginians. So a lot of that had happened through dynamic leadership. It's just it's not recorded. It's not remembered. But there is a difference when you have, if you look at the Peloponnesian War and the scale of the armies involved there, that even if Athens had fielded its entire citizen body or Sparta, its citizen body and nearly its allies, it wouldn't have been able to mobilize the number of men that Alexander leads into to attack Persia, let alone keep them in the field month after month, year after year. You've developed to a point where states are bigger, they've got more money. 
And it's, it's escalating because your rivals are doing the same thing. Wars take longer, they're bigger, there's more and more mercenaries, there's more and more professional soldiers, there's this development, and you get more sophisticated techniques. I mean, when you think, again, it's one of those things with hindsight we almost take for granted, but think of Athens' creation of a war fleet that will allow the victory at Salamis. Just how huge a change that is and how quickly really it happens where you're going from small raiding bands, you know, on a few ships that are sometimes traders, sometimes pirates, to fleets, and you know how to operate them. And there are hundreds of triremes, and you're paying the rowers to train to do this. So it's built up very gradually. But part of it is because the the city-states of Greece have spent so much time in their own rivalries and fighting others that the knock-on effects, the things they've learned, the ideas they've developed, the, the styles of warfare are transferred elsewhere. You know, you have developments in Sicily where not only you've got the Carthaginians, but the Greek cities, you have the tyrants in Syracuse and elsewhere are spending money on developing warships, on developing um, catapults, artillery. So they're taking many of the ideas, much of the ingenuity, the inventions, that dynamism of Greek culture, but they're using it in a different way and they're using it in a more focused way because their states are different. So I think that allows these people to appear. And it's, again, you, you know, you think of Athens, maybe they've got 30,000 hoplites if they mobilized everybody in the late fifth century to Rome that, according to Polybius, in the years just before Hannibal, has over 700,000 people eligible for military service. Now, the Romans were different. They were unique in the way they expanded. But it's everything's grown in the same way we don't remember the wars of the 17th century in Europe, or even the Thirty Years' War, in the same way we remember Frederick the Great, let alone Napoleon, because everything had got a bit bigger and a bit more organized, and it's come from that. Yeah, and besides the uh, increase in manpower over the centuries, the armies getting bigger and everything, you also have the logistical aspect, which is staggering. I mean, um, being able to keep an army in the field for so many years and in the case of Alexander hundreds if not a thousand miles from home is truly a, a staggering feat I mean how did they how did they feed and supply these armies so far away from anywhere it must have been a, a constant concern a constant priority because if you if your army's not eating if your horses aren't in at least reasonable condition then you're not going to win any battles so it's there and it's it's not talked about because it's not glamorous. And there have been various theories as to how it was done. Um, it's hard to pin it down because again, it comes down to just what was, what we think of as the most obvious solution to a problem isn't necessarily the most obvious solution to a problem for somebody in the fourth century BC. But it clearly took great care and it's clearly something again, Philip staggered people because he campaigned all the year around. You know, he fought in winter when nobody could and his armies moved quickly. So it's come from those military reforms and that the, the logistics combined with the siege craft. You know, Philip learned how to take cities and take them by storm. And whereas before that time in, in the Greek world, basically you blockaded someone into submission and it might take a year, it might take 18 months and you waited. And sometimes, you know, Athens couldn't take some quite small settlements. Now, the Macedonians sometimes fail under Philip, but they nearly always succeed. And under Alexander, they always succeed. So it means that warfare becomes that much more permanent in its outcome because the enemy can't just retire behind their walls and wait for you to go away. You know, when you think of the, the classic case in the Peloponnesian War where the Spartans turn up year after year and go around cutting down vine trees and plundering the fields outside Athens and the Athenians watch them um, and don't come out. And that's thought of as strange behavior on their part. But it's, um, you can't do that anymore. You know, Alexander can stay at Tyre for nine months or so and he gets in in the end. And it's very costly, but he does it. You know, you are not safe wherever you go. And that... The ability of an army to move and stay in the field and then the ability to take any stronghold just changes all the basic rules of warfare in that time. Yeah, I think a lot of people today don't realize that up until Philip, if you had a seaside city with a wall, you were very safe. I mean, that's the reason why the Phoenicians and the Greeks could colonize everything from the Black Sea coastal area to Gades in Spain was that... Um, you were safe if you had a wall and access to the sea. And Philip really changed that. Mm, and it, it, it's, it revolutionizes everything. Because, and it's, it's, again, it's another of those things that must have come as such a shock because we can't see 
just what he did to make this possible. You know, we know he hired engineers and spent money on developing siegecraft, but the details of just how this happened, because he starts taking places very quickly, and partly it's a willingness to assault and to be more aggressive, as well as the technology. So there's an element of taking casualties, but it saves you more casualties in the long run because you get a decisive result. So it is it is a big change, and it's something where the Romans, for instance, don't catch up for a very long time. Um, you know, they lag behind Hellenistic siege craft really until 1st century BC and the more professional army because it, it requires people who really know what they're doing. It requires a high level of engineering. And the sort of militia armies of earlier don't really have that. So they tend to go back, back to blockade unless they can find some Greek allies who can show them how to do it, you know, as they do in Sicily and elsewhere. So, But it's, it's a huge, huge change. Right. Well, since you mentioned the Romans again, I can't resist asking you a question that came up in an earlier podcast we did, since you are a Roman historian. Um, so we had... Steel Brand on the show, the author of this book right here, and um, he, uh, we talked about the famous claim that the ancient Roman historian Livy made that if Alexander had gone west instead of east, he would have failed to, you know, take take Rome, and uh, of course Steel Brand took the point of view of Livy and said, yeah, that's right, and I was like, no, Alexander was undefeated. Come on, so uh, what do you think? Would Alexander have been able to take Rome? I think the safest bet is on Alexander because he's got an army unlike anything that comes later on. You know, when Pyrrhus fights the Romans, he doesn't have the military resources or the experience of Alexander. Um, on the other hand, the army Alexander develops is much more suited to fighting in Asia Minor and beyond. Um, you know, it's got a lot more cavalry than are really that useful in many parts of Italy, though not all. And you've got to remember that Rome isn't yet what it will become in the days of Hannibal. You know, you're still struggling with the Latins. You've got these big conflicts with the Samnites. It isn't as overwhelming. Its population isn't as big. So I think there is a good chance that Alexander could have come along and defeated the Roman Republic, but whether he could have absorbed the Roman Republic. Um, the Romans are very stubborn from early on, so um, hard to say. Uh, as I say, it, it's you probably wouldn't want to bet against Alexander because he seems to overcome everything else that's thrown at him. And, you know, the fact that he beats the Persians doesn't mean the Persians were a pushover. They, they, this was a very tough fight. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd have to say I think he probably would have won. Whether he could have conquered and absorbed Italy and Rome and turned it into a province, whether he could have cut the Roman Republic short or whether it would have been a blip where for 10 years things are bad, but then they recover, who knows? And then when they recover, they're all speaking Greek. Yeah, and they're very angry. <laughs> but they, they were angry a lot of the time. So, it's, uh... so um, you start your book with this bold claim that some individuals change history. And you make a very compelling case throughout your book that Philip and Alexander were some of these rare individuals that just have a huge influence over events that far eclipse everything else. Now, uh, there is another alternative viewpoint, which has become more popular in recent years, which is to consider the macro, economic, political, demographic forces at work and to think of these, uh, you know, great men as actually symptoms or byproducts of other forces. And so just to play devil's advocate here, let me lay out quickly a case against Alexander and Philip being great and have you respond to that, okay? So, um, when Philip and Alexander came to power, uh, Greece had been experiencing a demographic explosion for centuries that Persia had not experienced during that time, which also co coincided with a technological boom. The Greeks were always fighting each other, so they were developing new uh, siege tactics. You find this already in Thucydides, new modes of arranging infantry, combining them with cavalry, naval technology. The Persian Empire, which had the most advanced army in the world in 600 or 500 uh, BC, has kind of fossilized by this point, arguably. And so um, some might say that also the, the Greek city-states were becoming too small to operate in the larger arena of the Mediterranean. And you have these fringe kingdoms like Epirus, like Macedonia, like Thessaly, 
there's a few in uh, Asia Minor, and some historians see these as the kind of um, incubators of the new forces, where you have you know these kings that have larger demographics, uh, more manpower, they can draw on the culture um, and techniques of the Greek city-states, but they have a lot more people to actually use, and so. So basically you have this demographic pressure, technological expansion, and it's going to be either Macedonia or Epirus or Thessaly that's going to just be the spark that unleashes this flood of people onto the Persian Empire and bring it all down. So, you know, could you say that maybe, um, as Tolstoy once said about Napoleon, Alexander and Philip were just the little wave in front of the larger ship of history that was inevitably moving in that direction? I don't discount these these broader factors. Though you do have to be careful when you talk about demography in the ancient world, because we don't have the reliable statistics. You know, you can't really say what's happening in most of Persia at this time. There's so much we don't know, or for that matter, in Greece. But it's all very well saying the circumstances were favourable for Philip to do what he did, for Alexander to do what he did. But it doesn't make them. There is a dreadful tendency when you look at these wider things. Everything seems inevitable about the past. And that is not my experience of everyday life. It is not my observation of the world. It doesn't entirely make sense. Chance plays a huge role in all these things. And if Alexander had been killed at the Battle of Granicus, mentioned earlier, that war would have finished. There's no other obvious leader. There was no other obvious king. The Macedonians are more likely to tear themselves in part in a civil war. And it might mean that somebody thinks, well, no, this isn't worth doing. Spartan armies have been marauding around Asia, Asia Minor, so have other Greek mercenary armies at various times in the earlier fourth century without really doing anything. And the Persians are clearly expecting something similar. Alexander's lucky, Persia's weak after its own recent power struggles and civil war. Um, Philip is lucky because he doesn't get himself killed early on in his campaigns, but he could easily have lost. And it, it, it assumes that battles like Gaugamela are foregone conclusions, which is not the impression of people who were there at the time. And from the accounts or of more recent struggles, you know, Napoleon might have won at Waterloo. Whether that would have made a difference to later history, because he would have had to have won four or five more battles, at least like Waterloo, against other allied armies turning up. But that isn't impossible. It wasn't inevitable. And anyone will know from their own life, if you're in any institution, any group, how personalities make a huge difference. And we spend most of our time when we're talking about politics, looking at personalities and how people act. So I think if you remove that human element, yes, the bigger factors are important, but there is a great tendency that the more you come away and the more you look at a distance, everything is smoothed out. So, yes, perhaps Napoleon is leading Ripple on a, a wave, but plenty of other people could have been in the same situation and things wouldn't have happened that way. And the individual personalities make a huge difference to how they decide things, as do all the personalities of everybody else involved that we can't see because we don't remember their names and we don't know anything about them. So lots of little things, but I simply don't see history as only the great, the wider forces, the, the driving factors, because that seems almost to ignore luck altogether. And yet luck and chance plays such a great part in everybody's life. And has, you know, there are differences. Things didn't have to happen that way. Alexander didn't have to keep going. He didn't have to die when he did. Things would have been different. Um, Philip could have been killed lots of times earlier. Alexander might have lost in those early encounters or might have been killed before he even went to Asia Minor. I don't think, you know, people have said, oh, well, there's Jason of Ferrai, just a generation before Philip, who's doing much the same sort of thing. But the point is he didn't. Yes, sure. That's a, that's a fair answer. I mean, certainly uh, individuals can create big changes in the short term, but the question is whether the greater forces at work uh, iron those out over time. I mean, like if you are a warlord in Russia in, you know, the 11th century, nothing you really do matters because the Mongols are coming anyway. You know, <laughs> and if you are like if if you're a a Mayan king trying to conquer your neighbor right before the conquistadors come, doesn't really make that big a big difference. So 
you know, Alexander does reach India, but then within a few centuries, most of the Persian Empire is back to being Persian, it's the Parthians. However, you could say that, yeah, but he founded all these cities and he did bring Hellenic culture to Bactria and India that lasted many, many centuries later. So, of course, you know, it's a complicated argument, but there are things to be said for both sides. It's also, it's, it's easy to forget how much continuity there is under any conqueror in that we often divide things into nice, neat categories. But, you know, Philip's, oh, sorry, Alexander sweeps through the Persian Empire, takes it over, founds these cities, makes it Greek in inverted commas. But so much of um, Achaemenid Persian culture survives, but so much has survived before that. You know, it's that, that striking um, Babylonian tablet about the, the period either side of the Battle of Gaugamela that begins recording, just as part of its normal astrological um, observations, that there's problems within the army of the king of the world, Darius. And then it mentions you know, the battle briefly, and then a few weeks later, it's Alexander, the king of the world, enters Babylon. And it's the king is dead, long live the king. But this is a completely different dynasty from a completely different country. But these people still have their own culture that's preserved. And it will be, you know, under the Seleucids, much will be preserved. Then under the Parthians, who are again a load of outsiders. You could even, I mean, there's a way of looking at the Macedonians as simply another fringe people from the Persian Empire, from that broader Middle Eastern culture that get a good army, get a good military leader and take over just as the Persians themselves had before, just as the Parthians would, just as the Sassanids would later on, and flourish for a while. But for many of the people living in this area, not a lot changes. But then when you look closely again, you see that aspects do change and cultural things and language. Um, so the further you step back, if you end up looking at sort of millennia as a short time, then nothing really seems to change at all. But that's, again, that's not human experience. For the people living, you know, so many generations past that thinking about, oh, well, it doesn't really matter what I do because in 300 years the Mongols are coming, that's, that's a long time, you know, that's, and you don't know they're coming and things might have been different. Other factors might have changed and maybe they didn't or a different group of nomads did. Um, so it's, I don't, I think inevitability is, is a very dangerous way of thinking and removing almost free will, but certainly the, the, consequences of the actions of all the people in between is a mistake because that isn't how the world works. That's a fair point. And uh, let's then zoom back into the particulars of these uh, fascinating characters. One of Philip's talents was spotting other people with talent and uh, not just in the military sphere where he knew a lot himself, but even in, in the arts and in philosophy. One example of this is that he spotted Aristotle before anybody knew who Aristotle was, you know, the man who would later be known as the greatest philosopher of antiquity when he was still quite young. Philip somehow said, oh, I want that guy to tutor my son. And so you have this uh, strange coincidence that the greatest conqueror of antiquity just so happens to be tutored by the greatest philosopher of antiquity. Is that a coincidence or do you think that there was something about that relationship that helped shape Alexander into this uh, unstoppable force. It's it's one of those great mysteries. We would love to know more, you know, what passed between these two men who are both so talented, but both so different. Um, but we know very little. You know, Aristotle was there for a few years. We don't know whether he was tutoring just Alexander, Alexander and his friends. You know, there's normally this assumption, you sort of see the classroom and there's there's young Ptolemy and all the others sitting there as well. We don't really know. Um, Aristotle, like everyone else, you know, his ideas were developing as he went along. So he wasn't yet the finished product. Um, I think there's certainly, you can't imagine them two meeting without Alexander being influenced. And the fact that we're told that Alexander is writing to Aristotle throughout his campaigns in the same way he's writing to other people. He keeps a connection. He obviously, um, and has that, you know, in a sense, a curious interest in the natural world that you wouldn't necessarily expect in somebody like Alexander otherwise, that probably comes from conversations in those days. So I think it's there, there clearly was an influence, but again, it comes back to you cannot reach the real Alexander, the real personality and know why he was doing these things. You know, even saying what he was doing is not always straightforward, but certainly the motivation, the thoughts behind it, 
Um, so you'd assume, you'd like to think, but on the other hand, it depends a little bit what you think of Alexander and what you think of Aristotle, whether you want Aristotle to be the big influence or whether you want Alexander to be the sort of almost the brute beast that, you know, was pearls before swine. He doesn't understand the sophisticated thoughts of Aristotle. It's hard to know. And you mentioned that, uh, you know, it's hard to know really Alexander. He's unreachable in a sense. And I think one thing that was interesting from your book, which I think a lot of people don't realize, because there's so much information on Alexander, he has permeated the mythologies and folk culture of so many different countries. But actually, we don't have any contemporary sources about him, basically. You know, none of the letters that he wrote back home to his mother or to Aristotle survive. We have a bunch of fake ones, but they're not real. Um, none of the contemporary accounts survive. We don't know what his soldiers were thinking. We don't know what the Persians were thinking. We don't know what pe people back in Greece were thinking, with the exception of angry Demosthenes um, in Athens. So it's, it's amazing that this period of enormous global change, where there are a lot of people writing down a lot of things, all that has been lost, and all we have are later accounts. And I think you do a really uh, fine job in the book of emphasizing just how little we know from the time period and how much we need to um, infer from later sources. And that's a, a problem for so much of study of the ancient world, but it's particularly true when you write about first century BC and the Romans, you know, you've got contemporary letters of Cicero. You can get a, a sense of the jokes people were telling, the things that made them laugh. With Alexander, it's the best sources are at least 400 years later. So, you know, that's the distance from now to early colonial America. You know, if the people writing were writing in a very different world. Um, they had sources that were contemporary to Alexander, but how they used them, we simply don't know. So it is always a shock. I mean, there, there is a tendency when people ask you, oh, you're, you know, you work on ancient history and they'll ask you a question and your answer is, well, actually, we don't really know usually people assume, well, that's you personally don't know, and the information is out there, but you haven't bothered to find out. Um, you're just not very good at your job. But it's, it's, it's one of the reasons that makes the ancient world so appealing for study is that you can relatively quickly read all the sources on a topic in a way that's difficult even for, say, 13th century England, you know, where the court records become so full, it takes years and years to study everything. But it's frustrating because there's so much we don't know. There's so much you want to know. What I've tried to do is ask the questions that you'd ask, even if you've then got to say, well, no, we can't answer these, but to remember that there, you know, there was more to all of this. And we may get a lot of things wrong, and our sources may give us a very false opinion, misleading opinion about lots of what happened. But this is trying to be honest and say, look, this is what we know. This is the information we have. This is how reliable it might be. This is what we're guessing and making very clear that the danger is when you write about this is you imagine in your head a, an ideal Alexander or Philip, and then you fill in the gaps in the sources with how you think your Alexander or your Philip would behave and write that as if that's history. It's fine if you're a novelist, that's their job, but it's not what a historian should be doing. You should be honest enough to say there's a lot we don't know. Yeah, this is a point that I probably stress more than anything else on this podcast, which is that we really should be aware of the limitations of our knowledge. Our sources are very incomplete and unevenly distributed. So as you mentioned, in the case of Cicero, what I tell my students is that we basically have his entire Gmail account, you know, like <laughs> thanks to his um, scribe slash slave Tyro, we have all the letters he received and, you know, a lot of them, right? So we don't have that for Alexander, not even close. Um, now, in recent years, in recent decades, there's been this shift in the way people, uh, scholars, perceive Alexander. He has become less of a hero and more of a villain in many cases, and he did obviously cause a lot of death and suffering. That's what conquerors do. Um, I'm wondering if there's any hint of that in the ancient sources, or if they're all positive. What, what, what have you found? Again, it depends on who is telling the story. And, there, you know, obviously someone like Demosthenes, who's there in Athens, who's been basing his whole career around opposing Philip and then opposing Alexander, this man's a monster, this man is, you know, un he's um, ruthless, he's treacherous, he's dishonest, you know, we need to destroy him, he's just a barbarian. So there were negative traditions early on. And then quickly there seems to have been a more hostile 
view of Alexander than were perhaps presented by um, sources like Ptolemy and Aristobulus or um, Cleisthenes before that, you know, the, the, the historians at court or those who've been associated with him. But again, rather like Julius Caesar, because there is a civil war effectively following Alexander's death, when a lot of things are written down, there is good reason for many of the participants to criticize their rivals, but also depict Alexander in ways that are convenient to them. So Alexander is extremely useful politically for a very long time. And that means that sometimes you're depicting him as the madman who would have gone on trying to conquer the world and would never have stopped. Or sometimes you're depicting him as the great hero and we must try and get back as close as we can to the great days of Alexander. So you see Hellenistic monarchs trying to be Alexander. And it, it, it affects even the the style they lead armies on the battlefield. You know, many of the more famous, the more successful, like Pyrrhus, like Antiochus the Great, they lead cavalry charges. They do what Alexander and Philip had done, and with perhaps less success, but it's they take the same risks because that's what you have to do. And there is this ideal to um, match that's set by Alexander. So it's happening from very early on, and there are the hostile sources. There were probably far more of them. When you think that one of the fullest lost accounts of Philip's life came from a Greek who, from some of the extracts, clearly didn't like many aspects of Macedonian society and saw Philip as a drunkard and a barbarian and promiscuous and all these things. So the hostility was there. And because it takes a while before there are that many Macedonians writing their own version, you know, you have people like Ptolemy fairly early on, but there's there are other takes on this. So... It's there and it develops, and then you have a mixed view during the Roman Empire in that some people see Alexander as the great conqueror, whereas, um, you know, Luke and the poet can describe him as a madman. Um, it's easy to forget that in the ancient world, there were often the whole range of attitudes towards people, towards ideas, towards things like imperialism and conquest. They were more positive than we tend to be, but there were negative voices as well. So it depended a lot, depended on your political stance and the convenience of the moment. Centuries after Alexander, even after antiquity, uh, you get kind of this mythologized version of Alexander's story. And there's something called the Alexander Romance, which for our viewers or listeners is um, this kind of novelized account of Alexander where he has incredible exploits. He even goes to China in one version. Um, you know, he fights monsters. And there's, I think, dozens of different versions in different languages. There's even a Persian version. Uh, there's an ancient Jewish version. There is, um, I think there's even one from Southeast Asia that has survived. And it's just amazing that, you know, for all the modern talk of Alexander as a bad person, and again, I don't want to, um, to downplay the destruction and suffering he caused to many communities, but a lot of those same communities then went on to adopt this version of the Alexander romance praising this guy. So, like, he really... I mean, what was it about him that um, created this positive legacy even among people he conquered? It's it's staggering. I mean, it's partly that, that sense of, of style and the force of nature about it. You know, Alexander comes along and he conquers you in a way that other people don't. But it, it's odd how memories change, you know, and once someone ceases to be a threat to you, you know, they're not going to come and burn down your village, then you can start to see the hero in the same way, you know, think how in the modern world we can glamorize Vikings. Um, and there's, there's, you know, fiction and cinema and television about that. But with Alexander, it's, it's clearly more, I think it's because, he, you know, he did just get so far and he did so many different things. And by the time they were reaching the eastern parts of Persia and India, you know, this was very new. The army and the culture these people brought, they must have seemed very alien and very different. But that Alexander came, he conquered, and then was dead, it is a perfect story. You know, this is the great hero, but he dies. You've got a good, a clear end to it. Um, and it then becomes, in many of these societies where you can celebrate bravery, you can celebrate military skill, and much, even with a foreigner and a conqueror, it can then become the great archetype. So I think it's that, I mean, I avoided using any of this for the book because I thought you're getting to the point where there may be bits of truth, little nuggets in amongst some of this, but separating those from all the 
the flying through the air and fighting monsters and you know the the, the weird stuff um, is is just not possible at this distance. So it's it's again coming back to these are the classical sources we have. This is the archaeology, what little there is. I mean, it, it's striking that rather like Hannibal, um, Alexander's campaigns don't really leave an archaeological footprint to any great extent. Um, you know, there's a few stuff, bits of things turning up in Spain now, but it's it's not very much which reminds us that sometimes the archaeology comes back to showing us this big picture, this long-term trend, and not the drama of day-to-day -day life. So I didn't use it, but Alexander is there, and you know he will go into the Middle Ages and people will be writing about him as the great hero. And um, you can find uh, there's a translation of one of the later Hellenistic military manuals published in Holland in the late 16th century that has a picture, woodcut of Alexander on the front, presenting this book to, I think it's Philip the Silent or someone like that, and basically saying, you know, the, the genius of the past will now come to you and your army will be great. You know, Alexander's that, that seal of quality, that brand name that makes it all um, good. So it's, it's strange, you know, he's, he's there in a way that others just aren't. Well, on that note, Adrian Goldsworthy, thanks again for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in today. We will be giving away this beautiful hardcover edition to one lucky viewer slash listener. If you'd like to enter to win, please leave a comment down below with your thoughts on Philip and Alexander. Which of these two figures do you think accomplished more compared to where they started from? Please end your comment with three asterisks so that I know that you're interested in the raffle. And in a month from the date of this video's publication, we will randomly select a winner. If you'd like to listen to more conversations like this on the ancient world, check out our podcast, Ancient Greece Declassified, wherever you listen to podcasts or at greasepodcast.com. There are dozens more such episodes in audio format there for you to listen to. Thanks again. <laughs>